Um, I just want to start out by letting you know that we even have a counseling ministry. Um, we used to be called Refuge House. Pastor Ralph and I discussed it, and we think it's better to just go back to Turning Point Ministries because we all come to a turning point in our life sometime where we realize we need God. So we're here to help you when that happens. We're praying for you. Um, turning Point is called to be a bridge to those who are hurting and they're healing. So there's an alcove right over here. If there's anything you need, you can fill out a form, drop it in the mailbox. It is totally confidential and we will get back to you, okay? So that's the first part. And here we go. So we sang earlier, right? Ain't no grave. Ain't no grave gonna hold me down, right? Um, I can tell you that I walked through several graves in my life. Um, the grave of fear, the grave of rejection, the grave of not being good enough, um, the grave of shame. Um, but there comes a time in all of our lives when we have to stand up and we have to say enough, okay? We need to come up out of the grave. Just like Pastor spoke earlier, talked about the movement. We need to move, okay? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. In Christ, okay? So how come we don't live like that if we're in Christ? Why are we walking around all broken, hurting, and that spills over on others? The fullness of God is a good thing, right? It's, it's not, it's not um, this brokenness that people see. The enemy stole that from me in the beginning, okay? I laid in those graves. I was afraid of who I was not. I didn't know. I had no clue who I was, right? So in high school, I fear robbed me of being in the drama club. Um, yes, we have dramas here, and I've been in them. <laughs> um, but it robbed me of flying. I didn't go on my senior trip because I was terrified to fly. It robbed me of... Um, I would never be standing here because I wouldn't even get in the choir in the beginning. I had to be in the very back row. I don't want anybody to see me. Okay, fear, fear kept me from doing my purpose, okay? Um, and my perception, I agreed with it. I agreed with all those things that had happened in my life. You've been through a lot in your life too. Every single one of us go through things, through hurts, through pains, through, um, traumas and if we don't get healing for them we just carry them around with us right so it wasn't until I got saved that I learned I was not given a spirit of fear I was given right a, of power love and a sound mind second Timothy says so if I was not given that spirit of fear where did I get it I picked it up somewhere right so I've got it through every hurt, every pain. When you're in school, kids are harsh. When you are in grade school, um, through teasing and believing what those people said about me. So I picked that up and kept it. I know from the Bible, time to time, people are going to need to be healed because it says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, right? That means there's going to be brokenhearted and there's going to be wounds. That's Psalm 147.3. And after you have suffered a while, the God of all grace who has called you to this eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It says after you have suffered a little while. So, 1 Peter 5.10. He restores my soul. He heals he, he, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, Psalm 23, 3. So we said trauma, right? Trauma is 
a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. So that can be something that happens to you. That can be something that you see happen to someone else. And that can also be like a life event. So we know the traumas that happen to us because we feel them, we see them. The ones that happen to someone else, maybe someone else, someone in your family gets robbed by gunpoint at night and now you won't go outside at night because you're worried about that. So that's traumatic to you. And the, the life event, when I say 9-11, it no longer means September 11th. It means the Twin Towers. And, and that put a fear in us, right? So uh, we know that we are not excused from trauma. The word of God tells us in Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. I'm going to show, we're going to show a slideshow. And there are going to be different pictures on there. And I want you to pay attention to how it makes you feel. If the Holy Spirit is nudging you or pay attention to that. Because we'll come back to it after. Go ahead, Belinda. So I'm sure many of us have been through several of them, right? So, um, too many people, too many of us are walking around with the side effects of this, beat up, staying that way. Jesus provided a way out for us. He's the way. Are we willing to follow him and do what his word says? I want to show you. We all reflect something. When people look at you, I don't know if you guys can see. Um, we all reflect. Um, are you reflecting the hurt, the pain? If you haven't dealt with it, nine times out of 10, you are. Um, we are created in his image. That doesn't look like his image to me, right? So each one of those lines are a fracture that happened to me. So um, I'm divorced, right? I watched my dad die, couldn't help him. Um, I watched my mom go through cancer and is going through it again, but she will beat it, right mom? You're beating it. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was not reflecting me at all, I was reflecting Every hurt and every pain. No one told me, no one ever told me that I didn't have to live like that. No one said I didn't have to go through life like this forever, okay? Um, it was part of the enemy's plan to rob, kill, and destroy me and the purpose God had for me, okay? I'm here to tell you that if no one has ever told you, you do not have to live like this. You do not have to live like that. When we live like this, we've been robbed of the fullness of God's plan for us. 
I know he has a good plan. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his masterpiece, right? We are his masterpiece, created new in Christ Jesus for good things that I planned for you long ago. He planned them long ago. And they're ours. They're just waiting. So if we look at this mirror again, right? They represent trauma that I've been through, but we've all been through, right? We reflect our hurt and pain on others. We have a cute little saying that says hurt people hurt people, but it's more than a saying. It is just that. Hurt people hurt people. It's the truth. Pastor talked about the truth. We need to look at the truth so we can live in freedom. What happens when we reflect our pain, okay? Um, I'm going to give you an example. We, I'm walking from the office wing to the sanctuary. This is not one that has happened to me. I just hope I thought this up. Well, but, well Holy Spirit, but you know. Um, I walk, I see Betsy, okay? I don't, uh, Betsy's, I know she teaches, and Betsy's busy. And I walk by Betsy, and I say hi to her, right? And Betsy does not acknowledge me. Uh-oh. See this rejection line right here? That kicks in. And I walk into the sanctuary and I sit down and I'm like, well, what the heck? What is wrong with Betsy? Right? Don't we do this? What is wrong with Betsy? So I'm now I'm sitting here and I'm stewing. It's in my brain. So now I say, okay, fine. I'm just going to not talk to Betsy anymore. I don't know what her problem is. I made a judgment that Betsy is like everyone else that rejected me. So I'm going to get rid of her because she didn't say hi to me. So I come and sit down and we do church. I do church, raise my hand, sing, pray, do all those things that I know to do. And then it's time to leave. And I see Betsy, but she's over there. But uh, so I'm going to go that way because I don't want to see Betsy because she hurt me. So now Betsy and I don't talk. Betsy doesn't know why. Betsy's like, what the world's wrong with Barbara? And I'm like, what happened to Betsy? Well, it's because of this. And you know what happens? God gets no glory for that. None. We just walk around in our hurt and it spills over into other people. And that's not the plan that God has for us. Okay. Um, he says, love one another, John 13, 34. And to be exact, it says, a new command I give you. A command. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Must. It's not an option. It doesn't say do it if you feel like it. It says must. And I kind of believe him when he says those things. Because he's taught me. He means it. <laughs> So, um, I want you to know that one day, you know, all this right here, living in that for a long time, God said enough, and he's here to tell you today, enough. You do not have to live like this. You don't. Um, Melissa, I have um, some people that are going to give testimonies now, so... We all know I love to be up here, right? Um, so, <laughs> uh, just like Barb, um, growing up, she had asked me to give a testimony, and I'm like, wow, there's so many, right? We can all think back in a time where we've walked through testimony after testimony of God's healing and his grace and his mercy. But the Lord in all of his mercifulness brought me back to the very first time. And that was sitting right in the foyer. <laughs> And I promised myself I wasn't going to cry, but here we are. So, I'm not going to cry. So, just like Barb, you know, I grew up in a household full riddled of drugs, alcohol, everybody in my, well, no, not her. I'm talking about this here. She's like, not me. My mom's great. Um, no. <laughs> No, I'm talking about the pain and the rejection, all that stuff that comes with a, a household and a life filled with drugs and alcohol. I mean, I can look back generation after generation and it's still there. Um, and in all of my ignorance, you know, the Lord brought me here 
And all of those things that I went through, the rejection, the abandonment, um, you missed a great testimony earlier. Hopefully she gets a chance to come back up, you know, about, you know, little kids just running around and parents not paying attention to them. And things happen when kids aren't paid attention to, good and bad. And so growing up with that left me with all these things, left me with all these hurts, all these pains. And I knew that there had to be something different. I just didn't know the way. And somebody had invited me here to Chestnut. And we went to a missionary service that night. I didn't come up in the morning. I didn't come to the front. I didn't give my heart to Jesus. But I came to the missionary service because there was going to be food. And pardon my inexperience, but I was also probably high at the time. So that was my life. I was young. I came to Christ at 21 years old. And in that moment, being here with that missionary completely changed my life. He pulled every one of my cards. Everyone. He knew exactly what I was going through. He knew exactly what I had been through. And in that moment, in that instant, he miraculously delivered me from drugs and alcohol. That day, I did not go back. I did not, and I haven't been back. And it's been absolutely amazing. And like Barb said, there, you know, we walk through this life. And trauma's going to happen. Things are going to happen. Hurts are going to happen. You know, but God is faithful, and he's faithful to deliver us from those, and he's been taking me on this journey, you know, of, of inner healing and deliverance so that I'm no longer bound by those things that I didn't even know held me back. I was 21 when I got saved. That's when people just start partying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah, legally, yeah, legally, for disclaimer purposes, um, you know, but God and his miraculousness, he, he wants to take us all on this journey. He wants to heal us all from every, even things we don't even know about. I didn't know I needed God. I didn't even know who he was. I didn't even, we had nothing like that growing up. I knew nothing of God. And my husband will tell you, because I, I know I got time, my husband will tell you, I remember when he grew up in the church, and of course he was living a backslidden life at that time. If most of you don't know, we've been together since we were 17. So... He, he grew up in church, and I remember that night that I got saved. I came home. I said, you know what? You knew the whole time you said nothing. How many of us are not saying anything? The healing is not for us. It is for us, but it's also for us to pass on. Amen? And I didn't cry, just so you know. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Felder. It is so much that the Lord has delivered me from, but today I'm going to keep it simple, but it, I want you to know that it is a way out and it's Jesus. So I'm here today on behalf of the Turning Point Ministry we all have been turned from our past. We've done things that we done that we might not be prideful of, or we came from a sinful life. And we turn to Jesus, but that's just the beginning. Because even though we turn to Jesus, we brought all that extra baggage with us. All them hurts, all them disappointments. It may have happened to us that a loved one died, a mother, father, brother, sister, Somebody died unexpectedly. You might have lost a job. You might have been sexually abused. I was sexually abused as a child. One by my female babysitter and one by a family member. I had to learn, I had to, first I was troubled, so I was very violent in school. I lashed out at everybody. I was a very mean person. The Robert you see now, it's free. <laughs> but the Robert you knew back then, if you touched me and I didn't like the way you touched me, you got beat up or we fought. Didn't matter who it was, teacher, people, anybody. And I didn't learn that until later in life. And so I was still carrying a lot of baggage. And also it caused me to 
um, indulged in drugs and alcohol. I did drugs for from high school, tried everything from high school um, all the way up to, I'm not going to say when, but it was a long time. In and out of doing it, in and out of doing it. Uh, drinking too. I believe I started drinking when I was maybe six, seven years old. My first drink came from my father. He was an alcoholic. But all that stuff never, I never was um, aware of it till later where I started my healing process. Start, stuff started coming back where I was understanding where my trauma had came from, what was going on that made me feel this way and do the things I did. Sometimes we, we blame other people because things, people do stuff. And then we blame God. Don't blame God. We live in a wicked, evil world and people do things they don't supposed to. They hurt us. I mean, they, they hurt us. And we don't know how to become free of that hurt. So we hold on to it. And we carry it around for year after year after year. And then you don't know how to be free. But I'm going to talk to you men. Hello, men. Listen, it's okay to cry. It's okay to talk about your troubles. If you're hurting, you could come and talk with me. Everything is confidential. Everything that you say to me, I can't fix you. I'm not going to try to fix you, but he can. So everything that we use, <laughs> hallelujah. Everything that we use, we use according to the word of God. And I found that from Genesis to Revelation, God has taken care and shown a way of escape in every incident or everything that we might come against us. Everything that we go through, he has an answer. And he has the only answer that can set us free. Amen? Uh, and then one more thing. Whatever you're hiding, you can't hide it from him anyhow. You holding on to that, thinking that you're hiding something from him and that he can't fix it, you're, uh, you're wrong. If he can't fix it, nobody can. If you don't release that pain, you're going to carry it all the way to your grave. You don't want to carry it to the grave. And somebody says, you got to learn how to forgive. you got to learn how to forgive. You think it's hard? Maybe sometime. But if you don't learn how to forgive, that causes sickness. That causes more pain. And then you carry it on to generation to generation. And I had to forgive those people. And I had to, before my parents, before my parents died, I brought my dad um, to the Lord. And that was... That was we we bound, we reconnected, for that way he wouldn't feel as though that I didn't love him, and he showed me he loved me. Thank you. The only answer is Jesus. It's funny. I had to beg them to come up here, and now they just like the mic. Good morning. Um, we come into the church and we have this facade. We put on a mask and a lot of us do that. Um, forgiving is, to me, is freeing the person and the prisoner. And the prisoner is ourselves. Um, I'm tired of letting Satan trample over me, um, and I want, in God's behalf, um, to do this testimony for him. Um, I was sexually abused by both men and women, uh, not individually sometimes more than two or three people at a time. Um, I started drinking at around the age five and I've been in recovery for over 20 years. 
Um, I used to ask God to give me amnesia so I wouldn't remember my past. It was just too painful, and I thought that I could never get past it. Um, giving a testimony does open up some really horrible wounds, but it also brings healing. Because um, I took a little longer than I should have this morning. I'm going to cut this short. I wrote a poem, and this was back in 2002. And um, it's called A Survivor's Memory. It was late afternoon when I ran into the barn, my heart and mind pounding, but they were not the same sound. I listened and stared at the rain. It made me feel secure, and I sat on the ground. The horror of the incident made my body feel numb. I trembled but did not feel cold. The rain sounded like little fingers on a drum. Each incident left me hollow after doing what I was told. I sat and hugged my knees as tight as I could. I cannot tell anyone I might be misunderstood. I try to stop what was going on in my head. I have to be strong. Tears must never be shed. Confusion set in for I was too young to understand that the brutal hands that touched me were also tearing at my soul. I hadn't realized that my pants were stained with blood. I didn't even know that my childhood they stole. There were other incidences each other, each one becoming harder to ignore. I didn't know I could have told them, don't do this anymore. There was a beginning, will there ever be an end? I will never break, but will I ever truly mend? So I'm going to come back to Satan and I've been in therapy for very many years and I am telling him I am forgiven and free because God my father says I am I am blessed I am highly favored I am strong and courageous God says he is the cornerstone of my life he will protect me. He will lift my head high. He will restore my joy. Give me peace that surpasses all understanding. He will put me back together. Open my eyes to new opportunities. He will lead me through triumph. He will catch me and he will help me cry. He will breathe new life into me. Cover me and will draw close to me overpower the lies of the enemies, make me stronger and wiser as a result of this trial. I am covered with his promises. I am more than a conqueror. And above all, nothing can separate me from the love of the God. And if we don't talk about that stuff, we never talk about that stuff. <laughs> we need to talk about those things. Um, my personal motto is I want to expose the lie in love so that we can live in truth. He's the truth, okay? We need to live in him. So how did I get free? Pastor talked about it earlier. I moved. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to say his name. Johannes, somebody, was here from South Africa a couple weeks ago, and he said, the miracle is in the movement. Okay, so what did I do? 
I came to every church service. I came to um, every play. I came to drama. I came to kids things. I came to guy things. I came to softball and watched. I came, you, I don't care what was going on, I was here, and you can ask my parents, because they thought I was in a cult or something, because I was here all the time, and they thought I couldn't not be there. I wanted, I needed to be here. My soul was being healed. I needed to be here. Um, and it was my choice. It was my choice to get up. It's your choice. And he's telling you all, it's time. He wants you to live in the fullness. He wants you to know how good he is. Um, God placed somebody in my circle that came to this church. And he brought me here. And I thought y'all were weird, I'm going to tell you. Because when I went to church, you sat with your hands folded and you did not do anything else. And I remember Patty leaping down the thing with the strings. And I was like, what the heck? These people, something wrong with them. But something got me, and I kept coming. It was the Holy Spirit. But I didn't know that then. I was like, what? This is mess. What's going on? If my mom could see this. Um, but now, it's like that love. It's love. It's God's love in this place. And that transforms you, okay? You ha but your, it's your job to move, it's your job to come, it's your job to open the Bible, it's your job to read and pray and be friendly and do the things that the, the Lord has told us in his word, right? So one of the hardest things that I had to do was forgive myself for things that I put on myself that I don't even know where they came from. And God, oh, I was mad at God. Yeah, I was very mad at God. I watched my dad die tried to give him CPR. I was really mad at God, okay? He can handle it. He's a big God and he loves us more than anything. Any attitude we can give him, he loves us. And believe me, I was Miss Attitude, okay? And it was always me, he was always telling me, you go do this. Well, did you see what they did? I did, but you go do that. Okay, well, you go tell them this. But they were mean to me. Mm -hmm. You could say you're sorry. Why is it always me? It was always me. Always. Well, I needed some adjustments. And I get that now. <laughs> Going through it wasn't fun. But, but we did that, right? And you need to do that. We all need to do that to get where God wants us to be. So it was a process. And by the time that I was done, if one person told me I was in a process one more time, Oh, I was like, I don't even want to hear about a processor. I don't want to know nothing. Like, but a process is a series. It's a series of movements to, to get you to a spot, okay? I couldn't even see my purpose because I was so caught up in this. So I didn't think there was, why would God have a plan for me? Well, whatever. Um, the truths that I had to line myself up with, right? I was made in him, his image. Genesis 127 says that. Before he formed me in my mother's womb, he knew me. Jeremiah 1.5. He had a good plan for my future. Ephesians 2.10. He's going to give me beauty for my ashes. Isaiah 61.3. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Right? More than conquerors. Through him who loved us. Romans 8.37. And I was fearfully and wonderfully made. Hmm. Psalm 139, 14. Imagine that. I had to stop fighting and ignoring God. I wanted things my way. I always wanted things my way. As crazy and out of control as I was, I knew what was coming if I had it my way. Right? During that process, God was... I had a friend that said, when I was asking God, why does this always have to be me? My friend said, well, why not you? What do you mean, why not me? I don't want to have to be the one to do all this all the time. Why me? Why, why did my dad die? Why does my mom have to have cancer? Why, does, why did all these things happen? She said, why not me? And I was like, well, thank you, friend. 
But she was telling me the truth. Bad things happen to good people all the time, right? All the time. But, but the truth is, it's the truth that sets us free. So if I walk around with my head thinking nothing bad will ever happen, that's not true. That's that, read the Bible. That's not true. It's not going to be that way. The Bible tells us in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He's overcome, right? So as I start this process, and Melissa, issues. Um, every time I came to, this is the, the word, the water of the word. <laughs> That's what I'm going to use it for. Um, so every time I came to church and I did what I was supposed to do, right? He's healing me. So my reflection is changing little by little, right? So I come back again. I keep going. I keep going to care group. I keep going to Bible studies. I keep putting more of him in me, right? So eventually what happens Now I'm reflecting him, okay? Now, are all the things gone? No, they still happened, but they no longer harm me or hurt me. And people see him now. So, and I can help others because I went through this. I don't, we don't have to stay in anything that has happened to us. Right? Jesus is for us. There's a difference. Okay? So, um, we talked about miracle in the movement. So, we are going to do a visualization. Um, Nicole's going to come up. And just, just humor me. Okay? Just humor me and go with the flow. And see what the Holy Spirit does for you. Okay? Um, God has a plan. He wins. We win because we're with him. Okay? Do not, we do not need to stay in the trauma. Please do not. I stayed there way, way too long. Okay? Now he does redeem time, and that's a whole other message. But um, Dawn, come pray so that we can do the, the um, visualization, and then we'll turn it over to Pastor. Father God, Lord, we come before your throne, Lord, we just ask right now, Father, that you would come and you would just open our hearts to what we're about to hear, Father God, that your healing power would be present, Father God, we welcome you here, and Father, we ask that you take over in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to have you guys close your eyes, just take a, you know, just find your center and just, okay, so I want you to picture, you're at home in your house or your apartment, and you see these small boxes lying around. So you go into your bedroom, you get two suitcases, and you put them on the bed. The black boxes represent your problems, hurts, fear, shame, bad memories, addiction, whatever you personally have to deal with. So you start putting these black boxes in one suitcase until it's full. You then have to press down real hard to close it and lock the first suitcase. You continue to pick up these black boxes. Oh, wait a minute. You left one in the corner. You got to go grab that one too. You continue to do this until every black box is picked up. You start to close the second suitcase and realize it's so full that you have to sit on top of it to get the suitcase to close. Finally, both suitcases are closed and locked. You pick up the two suitcases, walk out the back door of your house, and when you do, the whole scene changes. You look up at the mountains, bright clouds, sunshine, and you hear a voice that simply says, come. You start to walk towards this mountain. The pathway you are following turns into a dirt pathway, and you continue to walk. Your arms are getting tired and you're now weak. So you continue to walk, and this pathway now turns into a white paved roadway. You continue your climb up this pathway, and by now you are so tired that the suitcases are dragging on the ground. 
Your arms are aching, your legs are about to give out, and you finally reach the top, and you can see a pathway through the mountain. You can see the bright light, feel the warmth, hear the birds singing, so you put both suitcases in one hand and try to squeeze sideways because the pathway is too narrow. And you start to squeeze through it, but you're stopped because the suitcases won't fit in that passageway. Now you need to make a choice. You have to drop the suitcases filled with all of your hurts and pains to continue on your journey, or you can stay on this side of the mountain with all your hurt and pain. You look at the suitcases and slowly open your hand and all the suitcases fall. They start rolling down the hill and as they do, they open up all the black boxes. All your fears, worries, doubts, hurt and pain go tumbling down the hill further and further until they're out of sight. You now feel the warmth again and you turn and slide the rest of your way through that passageway. You instantly feel the cool grass on your bare feet, it feels velvet. The sun is shining and it's warm. Clouds are in the sky, the birds are singing. It's so beautiful and peaceful there. You run and skip through the cool grass picking up wildflowers. You see a lake in the valley, so you go and sit down by the water. You look up and see someone on the other side of the lake. The f this figure starts to walk over to you. And as he comes closer, you notice it's Jesus. He says hi and asks if he can sit down next to you. As he sits there with you, with his feet in the water with yours, he puts his arm around you and tells you not to worry, that he is with you and that he will take care of you. You give him the flowers you picked and your head is on his chest. He speaks something specifically to you and you're so peaceful. We want you to know today that God loves you. We sang a song on the earth of us about how God pursues us, runs after us, because he loves us so much. But we have to make a move towards him. And I know there are so many people that are locked in a, in a situation in their life but it doesn't seem hopeless. It doesn't seem like you're ever going to break out. We're here today to let you know that God makes a way. He loves you. He wants to take away your shame. He wants to take away your sorrow. He wants to help us. Jesus had 12 disciples. I'd like to talk about two of them. One is Peter and one is Judas. They both rejected Christ. Peter didn't denied Christ and the, the apostle Judas turned his back on him and sold him out to his enemy. After Judas had sinned, after he had sold Jesus out, he got, he got um, covered with grief. How could I do such a thing? And he lost hope. He said, surely I could never be forgiven for what I've done. And that played on his mind and Judas went out and hanged himself because of the shame, because he was hopeless, because he thought that Christ could never forgive him. He was all alone. He saw no hope. He saw no forgiveness. And he went and hanged himself. He died because he took his own life 
because of the shame that he carried by denying Christ and selling him out. And he saw no hope. He did not know that Jesus would have forgiven him if he had just asked him to. Judas did not know that Jesus would have forgiven him, him if he would only turn to him and ask for his grace and forgiveness. And so he ended his own life because he was a, felt abandoned and felt all alone. He lost hope. Peter did the same thing. He was sitting around the fire and when Jesus was being crucified and people said, I know you. You're a friend of Jesus. And Peter said, I'm no friend of Jesus. Somebody else came by and pointed at Peter and said, you look familiar to me. Aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? He looked at him and said, absolutely not. I never followed him. I never knew him. A third person came by and said, I know you. I saw you with Jesus. And Peter stood up and cursed her out and said, I never knew Christ. I don't, I've never known him. I, I'm, I'm not a friend of his. Three times he denied Christ. And then his Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. He cried. He cried because of what he had done to his friend. Because Jesus was his friend. And he abandoned him. But Peter did not lose hope. Peter did not lose hope like Judas did. He made it forward. And when he and Christ had their conversation by the shore, Jesus gave him an opportunity to be restored. And Jesus said, to love me. One. Why, Lord, of course I love you. And then Jesus asked a second time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Jesus, you know I love you. I love you with all my heart. Jesus asked a third time. See, three times he, he denied Christ. Three times Jesus gave him an opportunity to turn around, come back to him. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was healing him on the inside. He was giving him an opportunity three times to make a declaration that he loved he loved him. And so Peter said, Lord, I'll go to the end of the earth for you. I love you. I love you with all my heart. Peter accepted the love of Christ and the forgiveness of Christ. And on the day of Pentecost, he preached a sermon where 3,000 people came and gave their hearts to God. See, Peter believed that Jesus would forgive him. Judas did not. Judas did not know the depth of Christ's love for him. And so Judas was too proud to receive the forgiveness of Christ after he had failed him so hard, after he had been hurt, 
so long. And there are people that are walking around today and they think they've done too bad. They, they feel as though their sin is so great that Jesus would never forgive them. Or they've been damaged too bad that Jesus would not forgive them. I'm telling you today, it during this Easter season, that Jesus reaches out to each one. He says, I will forgive you. I will heal you of your hurts. I am pursuing you with my love. And there may be somebody here today that never received the love of Christ. Maybe you've never allowed that love to come into your heart and turn you around. Let's bow our heads. If that's you today, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, for whatever reason, Maybe you think you've done too bad. Maybe you've been hurt so deep that you are beyond forgiveness. So the Holy Spirit is here today and he's seeking after you. He's running after you. He loves you. And he's waiting for you to move. We sang that song, it's time to move. Moving means I change positions. Moving means I go from one place to another. Moving means I open my heart to God. So all you have to do is ask him to say these words, Father, forgive me. I believe in you. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I know I've been away from you, but today I come to you. Today I'm ready to move. I'm moving toward you. I'm taking the faith that you have given to me and I'm opening my heart to you. Come into my heart. Bring your light and bring your life. Allow your love to flood my heart. Fill me with your goodness. I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand, shall we? I'm going to ask those that have been with Barbara to come and take their place in prayer. Sometimes it's good to, for us to connect with somebody who's been through some stuff. Instead of going out, some of you need to come and allow these people to pray for you, to walk with you, to help you to deal with the things that you're going through. And so I invite you to come. I invite you to pray with, the, with one of these people and allow the Holy Spirit to touch your heart. Father, I pray your love will follow us. I pray that your love will follow us, that we will seek after you, that as we move towards you, that you'll come and flood our heart with your goodness. Go with those who are going, stay with those that are staying. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. God bless you, have a great day.